You're about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Don Cornell. Jimmy Durante. Rex Harrison. Judy Holliday. Jackie Miles. Carmen Miranda. Lily Palmer. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. So listen, America, the curtains of America. We're going to fill your parlor full of stars. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at the same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, we've had so many letters asking how we've been able to put an hour and a half show together with so many big stars every Sunday. Well, darlings, I'll tell you. Putting the show together isn't the big problem. The producer, director, the writers and performers put the show together on Saturday. But the dressmaker, the masseurs, the hairdresser and makeup man start putting me together on Tuesday. <laughs> so we all meet right after my breakfast, five o'clock Saturday afternoon. <laughs> well, that's our first rehearsal, where I meet old friends and make new enemies. <laughs> Now, yesterday, for instance, I arrived at the rehearsal, and Meredith Wilson and the orchestra and chorus were already there. And there. Gentlemen, here she comes. <laughs> Meredith. Yes, sir, Miss Bankhead. <laughs> the flag. Why isn't it up? <laughs> Well, I meant to raise it while the boys were playing that, but the saber keeps getting in my way. Do I have to wear it every rehearsal? You don't have to wear it. Use the saber to lead the band. Well, I tried that, but I lost half my violin section. Butterfingers. All right, forget the saber. Can I get off the horse, too? Oh, very well. As far as the rest of you gentlemen, good morning. I'll report him to Colonel Petrillo. <laughs> A boy, go down to the drugstore and get me some coffee. Me? Yes, you. What's your name? Don Cornell. All right, Don. Uh, get me the coffee. Yes, ma'am. A container of coffee? A fifth. Oh, Miss Bankhead, no. Don Cornell is one of our guests this week. A guest of whom? I was booked on the show. For what offense? <laughs> no, you don't understand. I sing. Oh, a stool pigeon, huh? <laughs> no, I'm uh, more of a canary. Uh, just a minute, boy. You seem a little confused. Start all over, will you? Well, you may remember me when I sang with Sammy Kay. Oh, Sammy Kay. We had him on the show. Oh, yes, he made that Walter Mitty picture and uh, Inspector General. No, that's Danny. Oh, Danny. Oh, I know Danny very well. He has a television show every Wednesday night. That's Thomas. Oh. Oh, Thomas. Meredith, why didn't you tell me we had John Charles Thomas on the show this week? <laughs> No, Miss Bankhead, this young man is Don Cornell. No. Well, why is he trying to pass himself off as John Charles Thomas? I didn't say I was John Charles Thomas. Well, if you're not, get me some coffee. <laughs> Here, I just got this. You can have some of mine. Oh, thank you, darling. You, you sure you don't mind my taking your coffee? No, no, go right ahead. Uh, I have another container here. Of... <coughs> what have you got in this thing? Coffee? Yes. You asked for coffee. You are young, aren't you, darling? <laughs> Tallulah, 
darling, how are you? I've never seen you looking better. Well, not me, Mr. Harrison. I'm Meredith Wilson. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Rex Harrison, here I am, pet. <laughs> Yes, darling. I'm so glad you're going to be on our program this week. Uh, where's Lily? Didn't she come with you? Well, Lily will be here in a few moments. She stopped along the road to do some Easter shopping. She went to buy some eggs, of all things, I said to her. But, Lily, why bother buying eggs when we're going to be on a show with Tallulah Bankhead? No, <laughs> <laughs> isn't he sweet? Well, Tallulah, it's going to be very nice being on the show with you. How many weeks' rehearsal do we have? Do we go out of town for the tryout, or do we open cold on Broadway? Darling, we open tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow night. Oh, tomorrow night. Yes, you had me frightened for a moment. You, uh, you're joking, of course. On this show, we don't joke. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I've heard. <laughs> oh, you've heard our program, Rex? Yes, of course, I listen every Sunday. You see, after working in the theatre all week, Sunday is my day of rest, so I listen to your show. I... Try to keep as far away from entertainment as I can. Uh, uh, well, now, tell me, Rex, how is your play doing on Broadway? Uh, Bell, Book, and... Uh, what is it? Uh... Bell, Book, and Candle, dear, yes. Oh. Our play is a very big hit. I hate to boast, but we're playing to standing room only. Oh, well, don't worry about that, darling. Someday you may be able to fill the seats, too. <laughs> oh, yes. <coughs> very good. Uh, but our play is rather different. In it, I portray a man who falls in love with a young lady who is a witch. What's so different about that? <laughs> but, uh, she's a real witch. Who isn't? <laughs> yes, I thought you'd understand. <laughs> you see, when she falls in love with me and becomes my wife, she stops being a witch. Really? Usually it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing on this show, uh... What do you plan for me? Well, I hadn't really thought about it, Rex, but it would be nice if you did something from the classics, Shakespeare, Shaw, or a reading from one of the poets, Keats, or Shelley. Well, how about doing something from Milton? Oh, Milton would be wonderful, darling. Well, good, I have a passage here from Milton. I, I brought it along. It goes like this. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the National Broadcasting Company, I would like to be half of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> well, come on, folks, these are jokes. I've got an audience warning up backstage. Oh, that, Milton... Yeah, you didn't recognize him. <laughs> nice, nice chap. You must have some of, some of, some of my kin. He, <laughs> he keeps asking me to call him Uncle Milty. He must be some relation of mine. Eh. Yeah. He sells petrol. Eh. Yeah. Taxico petrol. Uh, look, Rexico, everyone is quite familiar with that, Milton. We'll find something else for you to do, pet. Pet? Now, that, that, that's nice. Let's do that. <laughs> No, darling, I mean, you might do something from one of the things you've been in. Now, there was Anna and the King of Siam, and then there was Anne of the Thousand Days. You're rather partial to the name Anna, aren't you? Yes, very good. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> well, you might be interested to know, there's a play being written by a man named Kifava. It's called Anastasia. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I must investigate that. Thank you. <laughs> well... When do we start our rehearsals? There's quite a large orchestra you have here. They don't seem to be playing. Do they just sit around here all through the rehearsal? Yes, darling. It's one of the rules of the American Confederacy of Musicians. <laughs> no, you mean the Union. Don't dare mention that name on this program. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and one Yankee. Oh, Rex, may I introduce you to one of our other guests? Uh, come here, boy. Yes, Miss Bankhead. Uh, Rex, this is Sammy Kay. No, my name happens to be Don Cornell. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Cornell, Mr. Burl. How do you do? Uh, the name is... <laughs> Harrison. Oh, yes, Rex Harrison in Burl, Book and Candle. And now our orchestra is waiting for all the singers on the show to get here so they can rehearse with them, you see. Here I am, Tallulah. Oh, yes, darling, here she is, a wonderful singer, Carmen Lombardo. <laughs> Carol Miranda. Carmen, 
I'm terribly embarrassed about not remembering your name. After all, I've known you for, uh, well, how long has it been, darling? Ten years, huh? Oh, no, no, not that long. Well, it's been at least five years. I was playing in Little Foxes, and you came backstage to see me, remember? No, no, I never saw the Little Foxes. Oh, then it must have been uh, three years ago when I was in Private Lives. Mm-hmm, I was in Hollywood three years ago. Oh, well, then it must have been when I began this radio program about six months ago. No, I was in South America six months ago. How do you do? My name is Lula Bankhead. <laughs> <laughs> and you know our other guest. This is, um... Oh, Rex, I did not see you. Hello, Rex. Carmen, I haven't seen you for a long time. Mm, I have missed you. How about a little kiss for Carmen, huh? Yes, indeed. Mm. <laughs> oh, Rex. <laughs> Uh, Miss Miranda, may I present uh, Mr. Rex Harrison? We have just met. Yes, Carmen, why don't you start getting familiar with our script instead of our guests? <laughs> Are you acquainted with our show, Carmen? No, I have not heard this program yet. I have been very busy with my own radio show in Brazil. Oh, you have your own program. That's yes. nice. <laughs> and what sort of a program is it, Carmen? Well, I talk, I sing, I say things like, que beleza, que maravilha, coisa louca, darling. <laughs> 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 Isn't he colossal, forte, bonito, um sweet? <laughs> um grande abraço to Broadway, lembranças para o Herald Square. You do that kind of a program in Brazil? Oh, yes, it's very, very popular. And there is a famous actress who does another program just like this in Argentina. Oh, and what is the name of that program? All about Eva. <laughs> Carmen, my pet, why don't you rehearse the song you're going to do on our show tomorrow with Meredith Wilson? I'll be very glad to, Lula. All right, now, fellas. I know there are no curves on my baton, but keep your eyes on it, will you, please? I've been to Chicago and I like Chicago. I've been to New Orleans and I like New Orleans. I've been to New Hampshire and I like New Hampshire. I like North, East, South. But the place I like most is the best. So the place she likes most is the best. The best. The best. Ride along, sing a song. Get along, a little hot doggy. Get along. I wanna go to a big empty space where the cows and the cantaloupes play. Gonna be a cowboy cow. Gonna sit in my corral in the Ipsyio and Kaye. She wanna Ipsyio and Kaye. I want a horse with some good-looking chaps. I want to chew up the dust like they say. Gonna put me on some boots, gonna rub me on some boots, and hips, yeah, yo, and kai. She want a hips, yeah, yo, and kai. When I'm hips, yo, kai, I'll put a New Yorker to a shame. I don't know who she is, what I'm saying. But I have lots of fun just to say. I want to go where they don't have no fence. When I'm gold, let me go that way. And my day will be full when I throw a little bull. Hips, yeah, yo, and I, hips, yeah, yo, and I, hips, yeah, yo, and I, hey. Aqui se diz que eu não falo bem inglês. Oba, oba, meu português. Para eles, is the best. Sempre que eu acho que faz de baixo, meu capacho, não me agacho, acho que me esborra. Hey, Carmen. Yes, boy. Come back to the west. Well, let's go. So give me my rusty 42. 44. Give me a cow that I can punch. Cow puncher. Give me some buttons and some booze. Oh, no, no. And I'll bet you that I wreck or that I stay. I'm gonna be uh, a cowboy girl. Gonna sit in my corral. Beautiful voice, darling. And hips, yeah, yo, and I. Hips, yeah, yo, and I. Hips, yeah, yo, and I. Get along. Get along. Get along. Get along. Get along. Get along. Carmen, that was divine, darling. But we had sort of planned on your doing a song that you identified with, a, uh, well, a South American tune of some sort. Well, Tallulah, I know the song is in English, but it has the rhythm of a song from South America, you see? Oh, no, darling, not at all. I don't think so at all. <laughs> well, I do not expect you to understand, Tallulah, after all. You are, you are a Yankee. Watch your language, Buster. <laughs> 
From where I come from, you people in Alabama are northerners. Meredith, please, will you have those boys stop that? Well, that's more like it, boys. Hi, fellas. Oh, they're whizzing at you, Judy Holiday. <laughs> Judy, darling, 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 you're late. I know, there was a fella in the elevator. You know that old routine, drop the handkerchief. Pardon me, is this your handkerchief? Haven't I met you someplace before? Yes, I know that old gag. I never fall for it. He didn't fall for it either. <laughs> Judy, let me introduce you to some of the people on the show this week. This is Rex Harrison. How you do? Miss Holliday, this is a great pleasure. I want to tell you how much I enjoyed your stage version of Born Yesterday, and I enjoyed the picture even more. And I hope you win the Academy Award. <laughs> Fresh. <laughs> You, uh, you misunderstand me, Miss Holiday. I was simply paying a tribute to your talent as an actress because I think that your performance in Born Yesterday was one of the finest third-dimensional portrayals. It's been my good fortune to see in the theater for many a season. Get a load of that accent. <laughs> you must be an NYU boy. <laughs> and this young man, darling, is Don Cornell. Hello, Miss Holiday. This is a pleasure. How you do? Cornell! Place is lousy with college boys. <laughs> hey, Tallulah, you still single? <laughs> Judy, let me tell you right now, before we get involved, my marital status is of no concern of yours. And it has nothing to do with the show. And you're to rehearse the show and read what's in the script. The only thing I'm interested in is this program. That's the most important thing in my life. Now, is that clear? Sure. He's still single, huh? Judy! <laughs> what? <laughs> now, look, darling, can't we have an intelligent conversation for a change? Well, what could be more intelligent than a college boy? College boys could teach you the three R's. Reading, writing, and getting a husband. Where is the R in getting a husband? Raising a family, that's where. <laughs> Now, for the last time, Judy, I am not interested in college boys. And vice versa. And I am not interested in, uh, versa. <laughs> Judy, do you know, darling, I'm beginning to doubt you can talk on any other subject. Oh, sure I can. Ask me something. Go ahead. Don't cost to ask. All right. Let's talk about, um... Oh, uh, uh, well, let's talk about show business. Shoot. Don't tempt me, darling. <laughs> How do you like show business, Judy? Oh, fine. Especially when there's fellas waiting at the stage door. Oh, dear, here we go again. All roads lead to men. So why'd you take a detour? <laughs> Well, I know how to get you off the subject. I want you to meet another guest. This is Carmen Miranda. Miss Holiday, Carmen Miranda. I'm very happy to meet you, Miss Holiday. Oh, um, hey, didn't I meet you once, Miss Miranda? Well, I don't remember exactly. Once you on the coast, didn't I meet you in L.A.? Oh, see, see, L.A. Mm -hmm. And then I met you last year at a party here in New York? Oh, see, see, N.Y. Back to the college boys again. <laughs> Now, Judy, will you be a good neighbor and stop confusing our guests from South America? Hey, that's an idea. Why don't you take a cruise to South America? I have no intention of taking a cruise to South America. It's wonderful. You go on a pleasure cruise, you mingle with the passengers, and you meet a fella. I have never yet met anyone on a pleasure cruise I could tolerate. <laughs> Did you ever try a tramp steamer? <laughs> Judy, why are you so anxious for me to go to South America? I figure if you go to South America, maybe they'll take it away. <laughs> oh, this is a waste of time. Carmen, why don't you rehearse your song? Well, I heard it already, Tallulah. Oh, well, then you, Don Perdue. Don Cornell. You, yes. Well, you sing your song now. What is it, darling? I'm going to sing my uh, latest RCA Victor recording, a song written by Nick Kenny called My Inspiration. Meredith, how about the music? All right, men, get in there and play for Cornell. I'm about Cayuga's water. 
All right, fellas, very funny. Let's have the song now. surprise me. You really have a beautiful voice. Well, thank you, Tallulah. And you're really going places, Don. Thank you. And one place you can go right now, darling, is down to the drugstore and get me some coffee. <laughs> well, look who finally got here. Lily Palmer. <clears throat> Lily. Tallulah. Carmen. Lily. Lily. Rex. Meredith. Lily. Don. Lily. Judy. George. Who? <laughs> Darling, who is George? A fella. <laughs> I notice he only got four girls and three fellas, so I brought in George to make it come out even, because otherwise somebody's going to be left over without a fella, and you know who that's going to be. <laughs> Judy, will you stop worrying about me? Oh, all right. But I know your type. You're the girl at the party who always ends up winding the Victrola. 
Lily. Darling, you grow more beautiful every time I see you. Oh, thank you, Tallulah. And you grow more every time I see you, too. Uh, isn't she sweet? Thank you, I think. Oh, by the way, Tallulah, I've been wondering about my wardrobe for tomorrow. What do you usually wear on your show? Well, I usually wear a high neck, a low-sleeved, uh, long-sleeved cocktail dress. A cocktail dress, uh-huh. Uh, an old-fashioned. Uh, no, darling, it's quite attractive. Oh. Um, <laughs> what were you planning on wearing, Lily? Well, I have a sleeveless dinner dress. A sleeveless? Oh, well, in that case, I'll wear my V-neck dinner gown. Mm. Well, I could wear my dinner dress with a capital V-neck. Oh, it's a contest, huh? <laughs> Okay, I'll wear my new dress with the W neck. Oh! Oh, you have heat in the theater. <laughs> well, then, uh, then I think I'll wear my off-the-shoulder gown. All right, uh, then I'll wear my strapless dress. <laughs> Do that, huh? And I'll wear my strapless backless gown. I have a wide belt. <laughs> that. Well, then, um, I'll just play a highly dramatic scene on the show and bear my soul. Now, tell me, Gypsy, I mean Lily, uh, what are you and Rex going to do on the show? Well, I don't know. Anything Rex decides. Oh, no, not me, darling. Anything you want to do. No, Rex, you must decide. No, Lily, you decide. No, Rex, I won't decide. You decide. Well, somebody decide. Rex will decide, Tallulah. No, I, I won't decide. Speak, Rex. Here, boy, speak. <laughs> no, if Lily won't decide, I, I am walking out. Just a minute, Rex. If you're going for a walk, somebody better take you. <laughs> now, Rex, we're not going through this again. The last time we were guests on a show, I decided. And then you decided I hadn't decided on the right thing. But that was after we had done what I decided. Even Max said I had decided the right thing, so you went running to Phil. And, of course, Phil sided with you because he's been married to Marsha. And you know very well Marsha used to be on my side until she divorced Henry because he was already married. And it was then I decided I would never make a decision about deciding anything until you had decided. And if I had to do it all over again, I would do it all over again. Not here, you won't, sister. <laughs> Now, look here, you two. <clears throat> this is such a childish argument. After all, you must have had something in mind that you two could do when you decided to come on the show. Uh, I didn't make the decision to come on the show, Tallulah. Well, I certainly didn't decide. If you recollect, Rex, that night at dinner when you told me we had been booked to go on Tallulah Banquet's show, didn't I say, please, not while I'm eating? <laughs> Oh, you did? Yes, but didn't I, didn't I offer to try and get out of it by going to the dentist and having all my teeth out? <laughs> no, you did. Oh, sure. You'd have all your teeth out. And I ha would have to go on a show alone. <laughs> I saw through your little scheme. But you objected when I took a shower and offered to stand in front of an open window and catch pneumonia to keep from going on the show with her. No, you did. Oh, no, 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 no. No offense meant to lose. Oh, no, of course not. No, of course not. I realize you're both upset. And you'd say things in the heat of an argument. Uh, why don't you and Rex step over to that window and out on the terrace and cool off? Oh, well, thank you very much, Lula. Yes, I think she's right, Lily. Come along. Oh, very well. Oh, wait a minute. Look. Oh, to Lula. We just noticed that there's no terrace. No, you did. <laughs> well, I tried. Till they carry me away. 
You have been listening to Meredith Wilson, his orchestra and chorus. I'll take just a moment before we continue to say that this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Big Show. This is the National Broadcasting Company's Sunday extravaganza with the most scintillating personalities in show business. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, is brought to you by the makers of Anacin, for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield. The cigarette that has, for you, what every smoker wants. Mildness, but no unpleasant aftertaste. The cigarette that brings you Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. The big stars in this program are Don Cornell, Jimmy Durante, Rex Harrison, Judy Holliday, Jackie Miles, Carmen Miranda, Lily Palmer, Meredith Wilson and his big show orchestra and chorus, and every week, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, every year I am determined to get into the Easter parade, and every year I oversleep. But last night, I set my alarm for 5 o'clock. I was up at 5 this morning, out on Fifth Avenue at 6 o'clock, and what do you think? The whole parade had overslept. (laughs) I was so mad I could hardly contain myself. I thought I would burst. So I went home and loosened it. (laughs) And the worst thing about it was I had a date with a gentleman who was going to march in the parade with me. Hello, Chilu. (laughs) Hello, Chilu. And if I ever get hold of him, I will throttle him. Goodbye, Chilu. (laughs) Come back here. I'm talking about you, Jimmy Durante. Jimmy, I want to ask you a question. Okay, uh, which way is the television camera? Didn't we have a day to march in the Easter parade this morning? That's right. Where was you? Where was you? I was there. I was all dressed up. I was wearing my high silk hat, my cutaway coat, my striped trousers, and my genuine hop-along Cassidy shoulder holster. (laughs) I was dressed to kill. (laughs) I was a picture from the top of my hat to the tips of my black and white shoes. Black and white shoes with that outfit? A black shoe on my left foot and a white shoe on my right. Well, I don't know how I missed you in that outfit. While I was waiting for you, I was walking hither, thither, and yon. Three of the cutest cocker spaniels you ever saw. <laughs> one's a male, one's a female, and a Doberman pincher. A Doberman pincher? Well, that's that ferocious-looking dog, isn't it, Jimmy? Oh, uh, he only pinches people named Doberman. <laughs> Tell you I got a million of them. <laughs> well, all I know is, Jimmy, that you stood me up. I wanted to see that parade. You should have seen it. What a mass of color. Little white bunnies, tiny yellow chicks, and the cutest pink elephants. I know all about them. They started from my apartment. <laughs> but as long as I missed the parade, Jimmy, tell me, darling, what were the women wearing? Clothes. I know, but what are the new fashions? Well, the skirts look shorter and the men look longer. Shorter sure, skirts, that's interesting. Uh, can you describe some of the things you saw? I mean, what was the uh, predominant color? Tan, beige. Tan and beige? That's right, 54 gauge, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that tan and beige. But didn't you see anything else? I saw plenty. I was on a windy corner. <laughs> no, Jimmy, Jimmy, I'm talking about the outfits they wore, the dresses. I couldn't see the dresses. They were all wearing four wraps. Oh? What fur? They were cold. That's what fur. (laughs) The writers who wrote that should hang by the rope. (laughs) Everybody was covered up to their chins in chiller. Sixth Avenue never looked like that before. Sixth Avenue? Jimmy, the Easter parade is on Fifth Avenue. No wonder you didn't meet me if you were on Sixth Avenue with the hoy polloi. While I was there, I I met one of the hoyest of all the polloi's. 
Eddie Jackson of Clayton, Jackson, and Durant. Thank you. Well, Mr. Jackson, as long as you're here, darling, how about you and Jimmy giving us one of your famous songs? Well, say, uh, Rufus Rastus Johnson Brown. Huh? Hit it. Say, who's that a knocking at the door below? Yeah, and who's down a shipping out there in that hail and the snow? I don't know. But well, who's that a knock? Is that Mr. Rufus Brown? If it is, let's tell him what's on our mind. Let's poke a dime. Yeah, where's well, all that money you said you were going to bring? Don't tell me it's melting away just like the snow last spring. Now, brother, you've had your say. And you've had your way. Now listen to what we've got to say. Hell, hell, get it. Rufus Rats, this Mr. Johnson Brown. What you gonna do when the rent comes round? What you gonna say? How are you gonna pay? Tell him. never had a business as you hear me, boy, till Judgment Day. Yeah, and you know and I know that rent means dough all the time. Landlord's gonna put us out in the snow. And below. Now Rufus Rats, this Mr. Johnson Brown. Yeah. What you gonna do when the rent comes round? Say, hey, Mr. Rufus, Mr. Rams. Mr. Johnson Brown yeah. What you gonna do, boy, when that old rent comes here You round? got trouble What you gonna say And how you gonna pay Tell him You never had a bit of sense You hear me, boy, till judgment day Well, you know and I know Rent means so That way Lord's gonna pull us out in the snow Give him hell, Columbus Rufus Rand Mr. Johnson Brown What you gonna do when that old rent comes round? Let me hear that thing. Rufus, here's that music he'll come home. You bet. Say now, we don't want to preach, but we want you to know. Yeah, you got to save your money, Rufus. You just got to save your dough. And Rufus, we're talking to you like a lifelong friend. And if you don't learn your lesson, pal, it's going to be the end. Now, Mr. Rufus, Mr. Astus, Mr. Jocks and Brown. Say, brother, what you going to do when that old rent comes around? Say, he's got two first names. He's got two last names. And that's the end of our story. Let's go home, Jay. Now, Rufus, Brown, say, Mr. Jocks and Brown. What you going to do when the rent When we ask you to try anacin for the relief of pain due to a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, we are not asking you to try a new or unproved method. For there are many people listening in now who have been introduced to anacin tablets by their own dentist or physician. You who have received anacin this way know the effective, incredibly fast relief these tablets bring. Anacin is like a doctor's prescription. That is, anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. People by the thousands are using modern anison today instead of other ways. Doesn't their experience seem worth following? Try anison the next time you suffer pains from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted with the results. Ask your druggist for anison today. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to let this lovely Easter Sunday go by without a musical tribute to this happy season. Meredith Wilson has written a lovely Easter song for the occasion, and here are Don Cornell, Meredith Wilson, and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus, along with me, to introduce this Easter greeting. A pleasant little fellow came from Mars to pay a visit. And he remained the whole long winter through. Each Sunday he'd proceed 
to a different church and creed, and he always found himself an empty pew or two. In fact, he often noticed quite a few. Yet far from being tiring, all his Sundays were inspiring. Then one sunny day, all innocent indeed, he tried to pay his normal Sunday visit. But the church was jammed with people, from the cellar to the steeple. And the poor, bewildered man cried out, What is it? It's Easter time. The bells on the hill are ringing, ringing once again. There's a smile on the face of this weary world that seems to say amen. It's Easter time. The bonnets are gaily nodding, nodding to and fro, while the folks walk to church as they did so long ago. And there's a basket on the dining room table with fancy Easter eggs for all. And there's a lily in all its glory. Standing in the hall Oh, it's Easter time The dawn of the year is shining In the hearts of men With the joys and the hopes That have risen once again On the dining room table With fancy Easter eggs for all And there's a lily in all its glory Standing in the heart It's Easter time The dawn of the year is shining In the hearts of men With the joys and the hopes that have risen Come here, darling. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you wearing one of your famous fruit hats? They're so nutritious looking. Please, Tallulah, no jokes about my hats. They are very expensive now. 75 cents a pound, even more expensive in cans. <laughs> yes, bananas are expensive. But it must be very convenient when people come to the house and you run out of stuff, you just pass the hat, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Tallulah, everybody makes jokes about my hats. That's why I didn't wear them. You're right, Carmen. It isn't very hospitable on my part, and I'm very sorry, darling. If I make another joke about your hat, I'll eat it. Thank you, Tallulah. I'm sorry I'm not dressed up as I should be. But you know, I bought a brand new green Easter hat to go with my new green Easter suit. Oh, that sounds lovely. Why didn't you wear that, darling? I couldn't. It doesn't match now. The hat got tripe, but the suit didn't. <laughs> well, you should never keep a hat in the refrigerator. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm always fascinated by those extremely high platform shoes you always wear. They make you look so tall. And then, on top of that, the big hat. Well, how tall are you, Carmen? Well, I'm five feet, five inches. Five, five. Yeah. Well, the hat certainly makes you look taller, and the platforms on those shoes add a lot to your height. How tall are you without them? Five inches. <laughs> Come on. I've long been admired of that exciting rhythm you use when you sing. Is that something that you yourself invented? Oh, no, no, Tallulah. In South America, everyone knows this rhythm. Even the little children can do this rhythm, too. And there are so many little children there. I don't want to. <laughs> 
And now, how about the song you're going to do for us now? What is it, uh, Carmen? Mama, yo quiero. Oh, yes. I want my mama. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Carmen Miranda and her Brazilian quartet in a famous rendition of Mama, yo quiero. Wonderful. <laughs> Mama, 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 yo quiero Mama, yo quiero Mama, yo quiero Mama, oh, da chupeta Da chupeta Da chupeta pro bebê não chorar Mama, 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 yo quiero Mama, mama, yo quiero Mama, mama, yo quiero Mama, oh, da chupeta Da chupeta Da chupeta pro bebê não chorar Dorme, filhinho meu coração, pega a mamadeira e vem entrar no meu cordão, que eu tenho minha irmã, que é fenomenal, ela é da força e o marido é um boçal, mamá, 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 eu quero, mamá, eu quero, mamá, eu quero, mamá, oh, dá chupeta, dá chupeta, dá chupeta pro bebê não chorar, mamá, 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 eu quero, mamá, mamá, eu quero, mamá, mamá, eu quero, mamá, Daquele jeito, tenho muita pena, não ser criança de peito. Eu tenho uma irmã que é fenomenal. Ela é da vossa que o marido é um boçal. Mamãe, 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 eu quero, mamãe, mamãe, eu quero, mamãe, mamãe, eu quero, mamãe. Oh, dá chupeta, dá chupeta, dá chupeta pro bebê não chorar. Here's a word from RCA Victor. Fin your life with a new magic world of fun. Enjoy yourself. Have a Highland fling. Yes, that's just what it is when you and your family start enjoying RCA Victor's new 17-inch television console, the Highland. It's fun, it's fine, and it'll be the favorite of your family. That's right. The most famous name in home entertainment, RCA Victor, now brings you the best in 17-inch television with the new Highland console. There's a lot we can say about the Highland, but you just have to see it with its remarkable pictures, clear, bright, and steady, its distinctive console cabinet, beautifully styled, beautifully finished, and priced to fit your family budget. Then you'll know why this is million-proof television. Now over two million American families have tried, tested, and purchased RCA Victor Television. Let your family in for a Highland fling with RCA Victor's exciting new Highland television console. See it at your RCA Victor dealers tomorrow. Judy, doesn't Carmen Miranda make South America sound exciting? Big deal. South America. Stay home, put on an Xavier Cougat record, open a can of mosquitoes, and you got it. <laughs> Why, Judy, you sound bitter. To me, it sounds wonderful. I think it must be exotic. I think it sounds so romantic and exciting. That's what you think. Everything on this show is what you think. I think this, I think that. I think it's wonderful. I think it's exciting. Once, why don't you ask a person what they think? Especially a person like me who took one of those pleasure cruises and what happened to me down there. Why don't you ask me? All right, what happened, Judy? Don't ask. <laughs> I went to Havana on one of those cruises. <laughs> the 4950, a chick a chick a boom chick to spend a few days. A boom, a boom, a chick boom. I went to Havana. To chew. To look at the natives. <laughs> Gesundheit. To study their customs and picturesque ways. Arriba, arriba, arriba. <laughs> arriba. All winter long, I work in the office all day. I went to school at night to learn how to say yes in Spanish and Portuguese, and then when I got down there, nobody asked me. <laughs> Arriba, that's all they say. 
fella dances with you, Ariba. And how I skimp and save all when I eat those lunch counters, those crummy chicken salad sandwiches. Chicken salad, how I hate the taste of that tuna fish. <laughs> Saved all my pennies, gave up all my luxuries, bread and rent. <laughs> I, I played all the kids on the block with loaded dominoes. I listed three children as dependents on my income tax. And what did it get me? A reba. <laughs> it's bad enough for one girl to get a fella, but another girl attached herself to me on the boat. Oh, Judy, baby. Where are you, honey child? A girl, I said. <laughs> Here I am, Blossom. I've been looking all over for you, Judy. I declare I've been all over this boat. You married yet? <laughs> Married? Why, well, I declare, Judy, everybody on this boat must have the same idea Because there's nobody on here but girls Well, even the officers are all girls But I did think of something, honey child You and I'll sit at the captain's table for dinner Ah, who wants to eat with her? Oh, you mean... Ariba, Ariba Well, this trip is certainly a waste of time and money That's all I can say Well, there must be some men on this boat Well, yesterday I heard a man's voice in cabin 4G that's my cabin, Judy. <laughs> well, I just declare, I'm sorry I came on this trip. I wish I'd gone where I wanted to go, up to Sun Valley. I know a lot of fellas up there. Yeah, but that takes a lot of money. Oh, I don't understand about money, Judy. I don't know anything about money. I just don't know anything about money. <laughs> Where are you from? Well, I'm from the Virginia Hills. <laughs> Ariba, Ariba. <laughs> Fine pleasure cruise. I save my money. I figured I come out on the boat and I meet a fella and we dance and then we go out on the deck and look at the stars. And he makes a pass at me and I slap him. And he walks away and then he won't talk to me. And the next night, he's dancing with another girl. And I go to my cabin, and I throw myself on the bed, and I cry my eyes out. That's what I call a pleasure cruise. <laughs> I know just what you mean, honey child, but there are no fellas on this boat. A reba. Now, what kind of a fella are you thinking of marrying, Judy? A single one. <laughs> a reba, a reba. But what I mean is, would you prefer a young man with no money or an old man with a lot of money? A young man with a lot of old money. <laughs> well, come on, Judy. Let's go over the boat once more from stern to stem, stem to stern. Maybe there's a stowaway. Man overboard. Listen, honey, man overboard. I knew there was a man on this boat somewhere. Come on, Judy. Let's go get him. Arriba, arriba. We're back in the office. Not in the time clock. But you can bet. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. Oh, hear me screaming, Ariba! Stay away from my Here are two tobacco salesmen who are welcome at my door anytime, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Now here's Chesterfield's answer to Cyrano de Bergerac, Bob Hope. I'd top you easy, Dad, but we only have a minute here to sell Chesterfield. Okay, well, let's get to it. Better tasting Chesterfield is the only cigarette that combines for you mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. Mm, the mildness is a cinch to prove. You just make the Chesterfield mildness test. You know, open a pack and enjoy that milder aroma, then smoke them... And you'll know that Chesterfields are mild. And Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That fact has been confirmed by the country's first and only cigarette taste panel. So make our cigarette your cigarette. The reasons go together like this. By Chesterfield, Chesterfield, the one that proves its case. Yes, Chesterfields are milder, milder, plus no aftertaste. So ho, open a pack and give them a sniff. Then you'll smoke them. Well, darlings, we have a lot more show for you. Rex Harrison and Lily Palmer are going to do a beautiful dramatic spot. 
We have Jackie Miles coming up with one of his famous monologues, and Jimmy Durante and Judy Holliday have a surprise, and Don Cornell will also be back. But first, Ed Hurley, he wants to say... This portion of the program has been brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, the cigarette that has for you what every smoker wants, mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. The best cigarette for you to smoke. And now, Tallulah, if you'll ring your chimes. Thank you, Ed. This, darlings, is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is the big show. And here is Tallulah Bankhead to introduce her next guest. And it's a pleasure to present him, a clever young man with a style of his own, which has been rocking the better nightclubs for many a year. That would be none other than the appealing and personable little fella, Jackie Miles. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Tallulah. Gee, it's wonderful to be on the big show, and radio particularly. I'm crazy about radio because radio is the medium that really made the American home happier. I don't know, Tallulah, if you have a television set in your home and your nice people listening have one, and if you do, you know what television has done to the American home. It's ruined mine. I was introduced to television through my wife. I'm married, you know. You don't think I look like this from an accident. <laughs> but a year and a half ago, my wife and I were sitting in the living room, and my wife was talking to me, and suddenly she interrupted herself to tell me something. <laughs> Tallulah, you must allow me that little joke Because nature has been so kind to you, ladies It's given you a beautiful body Wonderful head of hair, gorgeous eyes, lovely nose, perfect teeth, beautiful mouth Then put a tongue in it and spoil the whole joke <laughs> Well, my wife said to me, Jack, she said How much does it cost us in the course of a year to go out and see shows and look for entertainment? I said, well, honey, in the business I'm in, it's a lot of money, about $10,000 a year Anyway, that's what I put down <laughs> So she said to me, good gosh she talks like that, you know. Connecticut girl. <laughs> she said, what a disgusting waste of money. She said, sweetheart, I know where we can get a television set for $500. She said, we'd stay home and watch the shows on television. We'd save $9,500 the first year and $10,000 a year after that. See, wives have the wonderful faculty for saving money the husband didn't make yet. <laughs> the money he makes, they got a budget book for well, I bit for it. I said, okay, honey, go ahead. The kid didn't like it anyway. She went out and ordered the television set. Now, I'll never forget this. If I live to be a million, and I know I look like I got three days to go. <laughs> the set arrived on a Thursday afternoon at 4.30. At 4.25, they were setting the antenna up on my roof. At 4.26, my doorbell rang. I opened it, and there was my landlord, the happy monster. I said, what are you doing here? It's so far from the first. He said, I understand you bought a television set. I said, yes. He said, and they're putting the antenna up on my roof. Didn't like the way he said my roof. I said, I'm paying rent. I don't want the whole roof, just a little part for you, you know. He said, we don't allow it. I said, how can you say that? I'm stuck 500 for the set. You'll break my kid's heart. He said, well, we don't exactly don't allow it. If you sign a new lease with a 15% increase and a 15% increase, we allow it. <laughs> well, you can't break your kid's heart, so I broke mine. I signed it. <laughs> Five o'clock, the set was completely installed, and that's when the trouble started. My boy, in the meantime, had been running around the neighborhood yelling, my daddy bought a television set. At 5.30, every kid in the neighborhood was in my apartment. 62 kids. Watching a show, you should excuse the expression, called Howdy Doody. 21 kids trying to get into the bathroom at the same time. The other 41, too busy watching the television set, they made from the living room a bathroom. Until 7.30, after Cook, Lafran, and Ollie, every mother came into our apartment, dragged the kids out, and mad at us because the kids had missed their dinner, as though it were our fault. We cleaned up the place. It was about 9.30 when we got it about ready when all the fellas in the neighborhood came down to watch the fights. You know as well as I do, friends, you just don't sit around a television set and watch fights. You make sociable bets. <laughs> they emptied my icebox, drank up my whiskey, and I didn't cash a bet. That wouldn't bother me, but what the television says done to my home life proper. We used to be a happy family. It's ridiculous now. My kid don't talk English anymore. <laughs> he has seen so many cowboy pictures in the morning, he'll look at my wife and he'll say, Ma, I ain't hankering for no cereal. <laughs> Since we got the television, said he's an idiot. The other day I said to the kid, how much is two and two? He said, channel four. 
And my wife, she used to be a lovely gal. Now she watches all those chopped up movies you see on television. That's not tough enough, but she buys what they sell during the picture. Anything that costs a dollar, she buys. We now got a kitchen with kitchen utensils no kitchen could use. Who cares if you can slice a pickle on a 45 degree angle? Who cares? She bought it. So it makes good coleslaw all day. She's rubbing cabbages on this thing. We get coleslaw with a cereal in the morning for lunch, for dinner, coleslaw. She bought another thing, a grating machine that makes carrot juice. I never drank it in my life. She's rubbing carrots and I'm drinking carrot juice. Never had trouble with my eyes. I'm going blind since I'm drinking this stuff. <laughs> she bought another thing, a thing called Quickie Pie Maker. This is the doll. Quickie Pie Maker. Two pieces of bread with applesauce in the middle. This is pie, but I'm eating it. She makes it. <laughs> and they sell you another thing called Magic Towels. Why do you think they call them Magic Towels? We sent in the dollar, never got the towels. Magic. <laughs> My wife used to cook the kind of things I could eat. Simple food, steaks, chops. Now she watches those chefs on television. I am living on dainty dishes like chocolate-covered oysters. <laughs> For a Sunday special, marinated herring stuffed with halava. <laughs> like I said, we were happy, but since we got this set, it's ridiculous. We fight all the time. We never used to fight. Now it's a consistent battle. She wants to watch the fashion show. I want to watch the ball game. She wants to watch Milton Burl, and that hurts me. <laughs> to make a long story short, she's got the kid now, and she's living with her mother. <laughs> That's not the worst of it. She's suing me for divorce, and she wants custody at a television set. <laughs> I doff my Easter bonnet to you, Jackie Miles, for a most amusing monologue and here's further cause for throwing hats in the air. In December 1948, Rex Harrison opened in what proved to be a run of memorable performances at the Schubert Theater in Maxwell Anderson's story of a tragic queen and of the thousand days. His portrayal of Henry VIII in that play is still a vivid theatrical memory for us all. Tonight, Mr. Harrison recreates the role of the despotic monarch, and in the company of his beautiful wife, Lily Palmer, as Anne Boleyn, brings us scenes from Maxwell Anderson's and of the Thousand Days. We meet first the king, played by Rex Harrison. The stage is shadowed menacing with the vastness of Tudor Castle. The king is deliberating over signing the death warrant of his wife, Anne Boleyn. This is hard to do when you come to put pen to paper and you say to yourself, she must die. And she must if things are to go as planned. Yes, if things are to go at all. If I'm to rule and keep my sanity and hold my England off the rocks. It's a lee shore and a low tide and the winds are gale and the Spanish rocks are bare and sharp. Go back to it, Henry. Go back to it. Keep your mind on this parchment you must sign. Dip your pen in the ink. Write your name. Oh, you've condemned men. Nobles and peasants, she's struck down a few herself or driven you to it. It's only that a woman that you've held in your arms and longed for when she was away and, and suffered with. No, but she promised you an heir. Write it down, write Henry Rex and it's done. And then the headsman will cry out suddenly, look, look there, and point to the first flash of sunrise and she'll look, not knowing what his means, and his sword will flash in the flick of the sun through the little bones of her neck as she looks away and it'll be done. It'll be done. How did you come to this? What were you like, Henry, when she flashed her first anger at you ten years ago in spring? How hopeful were you? How mistaken then? How ridiculous, and how much in love. 
The dark closes in and the scene flees swiftly to the Tower of London. Now a fugitive ray, a flicker from the vanishing day, illuminates the Queen and, too, thinks her thoughts. If I were to die now, Oh, but I must not die yet. Not yet. It's been too brief. A few weeks and days. How many days, I wonder, since the first time I gave myself to that last day when... when he left me at the lists and I saw him no more. Well, I can reckon it. <laughs> I have time enough those who sit in the tower don't lack for time. He could never cipher. He was shrewd and heavy and cunning with his tongue and wary in intrigue. But when it came to adding up an account, he filled it with errors and bit his tongue and swore till I slapped his hands like a child and took the pen and made it straight. A king, I said. A king and cannot reckon. <laughs> I was his clever girl then, his nan. Why do I think of it now? Would he kill me? Kill me? Henry, the fool, that great fool, kill me? Could I kill him, I wonder? I feel it in my hands, perhaps I could. So perhaps he could kill me. Perhaps he could kill me. The dies cast, the wondrous moment of love and marriage fled. Anne has reached the end of her thousand days. A light that has no sun in it falls through leaded windows and makes pale the cheek of the queen who stands accused of infidelity. The trial, the travesty, nears its end. But Henry has not been able to stay away. I was a fool to come here. Why did you come? Because I wanted to know. Because I wanted to know. And still I don't know. No man ever knows. Whether I was unfaithful to you. Yes, just that. Whether you were unfaithful to me while I loved you. But I'll never know whether you say yes or no. I won't be sure either way, fool that I am, that all men are. They are fools and fools, King Henry. You've shut me up here to be tried for adultery and treason toward you. You've done this because you love elsewhere, and I know it. But now you come here to make sure whether there were truly adultery. Because that would touch your manhood and your pride. And you wait and listen, a cat in a corner, watching the pet mouse run before it died. And then you come out to make sure. And, oh, fool of oh, fools, even so... My heart and my eyes are glad of you. Fool of all women that I am, I'm glad of you here. Go then. Keep your pride of manhood. You know about me now. Nan. Mind I ask no pity of you. Nan, I have no wish to harm you. I am much moved by what you said. I'd rather a year cut out of my life than do you wrong after these words of yours. Did you say, did you say truly you were glad of me here? I won't say it again, but I did say it, and it was true. Then let's do all this gently, Nan, for old time's sake. I have to prove that I can father a king to follow me. You and I will not have a son now. God has spoken there. Go quietly. 
Sign the nullification. No! We were king and queen, man and wife together. I keep that. Take it from me as best you can. You do leave me no choice. Would you let this grind on the way it's going? You would if it served your purpose. I remember your saying, let them die upon the time. You've forgotten it, no doubt. No! I did say it. These things look different from the other end. If I'd known then what I feel now, I couldn't have done it. No. I've been your wife. Could you do it to me? Yes, if you stood in my way, defiantly as you do. You're not old. You've been long a king, but you're still young and could change. You said on that one day when we loved each other, remember? That one day when I loved you and you loved me, that you could change, would seek justice, would be such a king as man hoped you'd be when you came to the throne. It's not too late for that. Only, if you harden in your mind toward me and say, it's nothing like the other rats and rabbits, let her be cut and torn and buried, then I think it will be indeed too late. The king, the great king you might have been, will have died in you. Mm. Now, I'll tell you truly, I do want to begin again, and I can't with you. You brought me into blood. That bloody business of the death of Moore and all the pity for folk who were like him and wouldn't sign. Your hand was to that. It's bloodstained. And yours, not yours. What you truly want, though you may not know it, is a fresh, frail, innocent maid who will make you feel fresh and innocent again and young again. Jane Seymour is the name. It could be anyone, only virginal and sweet. And when you've had her, you'll want someone else. It's not true. Meanwhile, to get her, you'll murder if you must. Why, then you've decided, and so have I. Before you go, perhaps you should hear one thing. I lied to you. I loved you, but I lied to you. I was untrue. Untrue with many. This is a lie. Is it? Take it to, to your grave. Believe it, I was untrue. Why, then you settle. It's settled. You asked for it, you shall have it. Quite correct. Only what I take to my grave, you take to yours. With many, not with one. Many. She is guilty. Proceed with the mummery. My signature. Lend me your pen. She lies. She lies. She was not unfaithful to me. But if she lies, let her die for lying. Let her die. Oh, God. Oh, God. Sometimes I seem to sit in a motionless dream and watch while I do a horrible thing and know that I do it and all the clocks in all the world stand still. Waiting. What is she thinking in this haunted interval while no moat falls through the shaft of sunlight and no man takes a breath? I've never thought what it was like to die, to become meat that rots, then food for shrubs and the long roots of vines. The grape could reach me. I may make him drunk before many years. <laughs> Someone told me the story of the homely daughter of Sir Thomas More climbing at night up the trestles of London Bridge where they stuck her father's head on a pike and hunting among the stinking and bloody heads of criminals till she found her father's head, his beard matted and hard with blood, and climbing down with it and taking it home to bury in the garden, perhaps. Would they fix my head up on London Bridge? No. No, even Henry would object to that. I'd been his queen. He kissed my lips. No, he wouldn't want it. No, I lie in lead or brass. Meat. Dead meat. But if my head were on the bridge, he wouldn't climb to take it down. Nobody'd climb for me. I could stay and face up the river and my long hair blow out and tangle around the spikes in my small neck. 
till the seabirds took me, and there was nothing but a wisp of hair and a cup of bone. I must think of something to say when the time comes. If I could say it with the axe edge toward me, could I do it? Could I lay my head down and smile and speak till the blow comes? They say it's subtle, it doesn't hurt. There's no time. No time! That's the end of time. Shall I tear this? No. Go your way, and I'll go mine. You to your death, and I to my expiation. For there is such a thing as expiation. It involves dying to live. Death is a thing the coroner can see. I'll stick by that. A coroner wouldn't know you died young, Henry. And yet, you did. Hark! Hark! Burn these records! The trial is over! The thing is done! <laughs> To you, Rex Harrison and Lily Palmer, our highest praise for one of the finest dramatic contributions to the big show. Oh, I don't know, Tillou. Did you ever hear me play uh, Henry VIII? You, Jimmy. <laughs> and why not? Me and my leading lady, Miss Judy Holliday. A little music, uh, a little music, Meredith. Yes, Meredith. Some King Henry music. Uh, preferably, you go to my head. <laughs> It's hard to sign this paper and have her beheaded. It's hard to do. I can't write. <laughs> I'll just sign it with a Rex. But should I or shouldn't I? Wouldst I should or wouldst I shouldn't? What if I do cut off her head? She'll still have one left over. <laughs> but on the other hand, I hate to do it. She just bought a new Easter hat yesterday. I'm torn between should and shouldn't. I know what. I'll toss a coin. Heads I cut off her head. Tails. I'm in trouble. <laughs> your head off these days, it's very fast. <laughs> Push, pull, click, click, new blame. <laughs> I hope it don't hurt. Before he cuts my head off, I'll take a couple ass, Anderson. Oh, I'm glad you didn't say that word. <laughs> We'd have been out of a job. with a dentist. Uh, I wonder, is he gonna do it or not? Henry! Henry Tudor! Coming, Nana! I don't know why you're in such a hurry to cut off my head. Why don't you wait a little while? Maybe it'll fall off by itself. <laughs> and all I want to know is one thing before I have you beheaded. Do you have any other boyfriends? Well, answer me. I think I'll rest on my laurels. When you talk to me, look at me. Stop staring at my neck. <laughs> and I love you. Let's you and me start over again. Just you and me. 
Just the two of us. I love you, Anne. Harry, will you put that chicken down when you're talking to me? <laughs> what a slob. <laughs> Always eating. No wonder they call you Henry the Eight. <laughs> Anne, answer me. Did you ever have another boyfriend? Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lie. <laughs> Who was he? Ha, huh? guess. Willie? No. Dave? No. Jim? Uh, Jim who? <laughs> Jim Williams? No. George? No. Tom? No. Jim? Jim who? Jim Baxter? No. <laughs> Am I warm? I can't remember. <laughs> can't remember, huh? Can't, huh? <laughs> Honestly, you lose your head if it wasn't attached to your shoulders. Why do you have to cut off my head? Because then I will be taller than you are. <laughs> What's the matter? Can't you lop a little off the other end? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the best I can do. No hard feelings, Anne. You ain't mad. Mad? I should say not. Look, I sing. Bewitched, bothered, and beheaded am I. This is Easter Sunday, a day of hopes reborn and of faith rededicated. One of its symbols is the white cross of the lily. Today, by coincidence, is also the anniversary of a death, the death of Clara Barton, whose life is symbolized by another cross, the Red Cross, emblem of man's love for man and the doctrine that each of us is and must be his brother's keeper. On this feast of the resurrection, I want you to hear part of a letter. It came not to us, but to the American Red Cross. It's signed by a man who discovered the true meaning of the Red Cross on the battlefields of Korea. He writes... They picked me up for dead last fall near the Natung River in Korea. And when I came to, I was in a hospital in Osaka. There was somebody holding my hand, just sitting there, holding my hand, not talking. I didn't feel like talking. I was blind and scared, so scared. It was like I was a baby. I pretended to myself it was my mother's hand. I guess I must have almost broken it. Well, after a while, she began to talk, low and slow and sort of easy. She said she was with the Red Cross, a gray lady, and she didn't give me any hooey about everything being just fine. It was rugged. She knew it, and I knew it. We talked not just once or twice, but, but for days. And after a while, I came around to where I wasn't feeling on top of the world, but, well, I could take it. Then all of a sudden, it hit me. What about my family? How were they going to feel when they found I was blind? And they were going to spend the rest of their lives taking care of me. She wrote a letter, and they got it, so that when I got back home, they were like me, they could take it. They operated on my head while I was still in Japan, and I guess it was really something, because they had to give me nine pints of Red Cross blood to keep me alive. And right now, I'm walking around with a plastic graft under my haircut. 
Back in the States at St. Albans Hospital, the Red Cross was just like it was over there. Somebody always doing something for me. I'm out on convalescent leave. And I can see. I've got my sight back. I just want to say thanks. Thanks to the Red Cross. Thanks for everything. Signed, Sergeant William Potashnik. Ladies and gentlemen, need I say more? America, 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 live on. Ladies and gentlemen, on this Easter Sunday, let us give more than we ever have before to the American Red Cross. Well, darlings, we're off now for Hollywood, where our guests next week will be Miss Ethel Barrymore, Bing Crosby, Joan Davis, Bob Hope, Van Johnson, Edzio Pinza, and others, and, of course, our very own Meredith Wilson and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus. Until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away, Judy. May you find that long-awaited golden day today. Jackie? May your troubles all be small ones and your fortunes ten times ten, Jimmy. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again, Lily. May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. Meredith. May there be a silver lining of every cloud you see Rex, fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows Never mind what might have been coming May the good Lord bless you and keep you Till we'll meet again, Don May you long recall each rainbow Then you'll soon forget the rain May the warm and tender memories Be the ones that will remain Fill your dreams with sweet May the good Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. Happy Easter, darlings, and Godspeed to our armed forces all over the world who hear these broadcasts each week. The Big Show is produced and directed by D. Engelbach and written by Goodman Ace, Selma Diamond, George Foster, Mort Green, and Frank Wilson. This is Ed Hurley, he's speaking. <laughs> Bill and Alice, and later be sure to hear Theater Guild on NBC. NBC.